It was the most successful celebrity endorsement that never happened. Nineteen fifteen, the Liberty Theater in New York, Beau Arts Palace, a stunning place for a Broadway show. And in rare cases, the showcase of a new medium, the moving picture. Its palatial 100-foot lobby opened into Times Square. And you, the other 999 guests, gaze at the window with an ornate carving of the Liberty Bell and an American eagle. You take the promenade to the orchestra seating, noting the ivory, amber, and gold touches. The lights go out, and you wait for the beam of light to hit the screen. You've seen movie pictures before. You've seen your New York hat, your great train robbery. But this is a bit different. This time, the whole screen doesn't open up in light, just a small circle. It's an iris effect, but you don't know it. In one scene, you see a mother and child sobbing, and you feel for them, especially because they are so close. Every moving picture you've seen so far, you've seen actors from head to foot, the whole person on the screen. This mother and child sobbing are so large that you can see their faces close up, or so it would be called. Light fills the screen, the iris has opened, and the camera moves horizontally so that you can see why the mother and child are crying now. General Sherman's army has blazed a trail through their town. You are moved and perhaps feeling not so good about the general. There's a scene at night with fire. A night scene in a movie? The truth is, a crafty director threw a magnesium flare at a group of probably surprise actors in a remote California village. But when you see it, the result is terror and fire. It's cinema like you've never seen before. Impossible scenes that couldn't happen in stage productions. Action happening in the foreground and background at the same time. Huge battle scenes. Flipping back and forth between two scenes occurring in different places. So you see the hostage, and you see the rescuer. Will they make it in time? Back and forth. Can't do that on stage. Something called parallel editing. But that's not in your lexicon. Birth of a Nation was one of the most influential films, thousands of films after it, borrowed from its techniques, if not its content. D.W. Griffith, mastermind of the movie, was raised in a poor Kentucky family and started as a superintendent of a small Louisville, Kentucky theater. He took to the road with an actor's company. He wanted to be a stage actor, but settle for film acting work, seen as much lower level at the time. He joined Thomas Edison's Bronx studio in New York as an actor, Quickly, he learned how to direct movies and how to make them fast, and he used innovative techniques. In just a few years, he had made hundreds of movies for Edison and some other companies that he had worked for. He soon got his own backers. Innovative techniques, almost none of which were his invention, but he was putting them to use all at once. But Griffith had another desire, more than just expanding the possibilities of cinema. The son of Roaring J. Griffith, a colonel in the Confederate Army. D.W. Griffith wanted to use this new medium to tell Americans what he saw as the real story of the South, the real history. Noble underdogs, ruined by the North, ruined by war. Their rights trampled on so that black slaves could be free. This was his view. And for a source, he had Thomas Dixon's the Klansman, a 1905 novel with the same purpose. The very innovative techniques we love in movies today, the flashback scene, parallel scenes, speeding to increase the intensity, even the little dissolve effect, all of it employed to try to make you an open mind, a northerner who maybe has heard of civil war only from old stories, 
fall in line with Griffith's point of view, a point of view that today we would see as bigoted and racist. For instance, you see projected on the screen an empty courtroom, clean, serene, looking like it's fitting the great state of South Carolina. Then the dissolve, and the same courtroom, now occupied by newly elected state legislators under the Reconstruction. They're African American. In Griffith's world, they're not portrayed as noble lawmakers, however, pioneers of racial justice. Some of these legislators have no shoes. Others are eating while the legislature is in session. And still others are drinking whiskey. They pass, the words on the screen tell you, a law allowing interracial marriage. This dissolve effect is intended to get you mad so that you feel the difference between the world before the war, pure, clean, serene, and the corruption of the Reconstruction government. And the attack on the corruption of the Reconstruction is wholly aimed at blacks. In another scene, a black man named Gus follows a fair white woman, Flora, home, all the while saying he must marry her. A terrified Flora runs into the woods, followed by Gus. After a suspenseful chase, the kind like you have not seen in pictures, Flora jumps off the cliff. And who in Griffith's racist mind can get revenge? Only the white-hooded horsemen of the newly formed secret organization, the Ku Klux Klan, who hunt Gus and kill him. Part of the movie where he expects the audience to cheer. But propaganda is both subtle and direct. When the state's governor orders a crackdown, the two Klansmen who led the attack on Gus are hidden by two former Union soldiers. That's okay, says one of those silent era movie titles that you see on the screen, the intertitles, because the former enemies North and South are united again in defense of their Aryan birthright. Other intertitles quote from President Woodrow Wilson's 1902 history book, making it seem like he supports the whole movie. His textbook was critical of the Reconstruction government that Griffith attacks in the movie, but Woodrow Wilson's history did not celebrate the Klan the way Birth of a Nation does. The crescendo of this movie, not surprisingly, is a marching army of Klan horsemen who fight the state militia and rescue the Klansmen who are captured and rescue the fair maidens as well. In the last scene, there's an image of Jesus Christ and a call for peace. We see the movie's depiction of blacks now as horrific, but it's not just a view of modernity. The movie was controversial from the start. The NAACP picketed the movie in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. In Illinois, the state banned the film. The court overturned that ban. In Boston, a dramatic city council meeting was had. Mayor James Curley allowed the movie to show, but with some editing. In New York City, where we had laid our scene, Outside of that theater that we were in, the Liberty Theater, there would have been a strange scene. White-robed Klansmen on actual horses, sent by the producers for publicity purposes, would have been matched by a faithful picket of the NAACP, who appeared in Times Square every day that the movie was shown. D.W. Griffith knew he would get criticism of his movie, and to counter it, Griffith sought big backers. The author of the book was a classmate, of President Woodrow Wilson. Dixon wrote to his friend and said, I want you to see the movie, not for political reasons, not because it's history, but because it demonstrates a new medium, a universal language of moving pictures that could change minds. See it as a history and sociology exercise. This was appealing, of course, to Wilson, who was former president of Princeton University, but Dixon's motives would be clear later. Woodrow Wilson indeed did see it in the White House on February 1915. Now, word starts to leak out that the president really liked the movie, including this quote. It's like writing history with lightning, and it is all terribly true. Word of Wilson's endorsement spread. Of course, Griffith didn't mind spreading it around or to Dixon, especially whenever the film was being contested by censorship boards in the North. Another viewing in Washington was held for Congress and some Supreme Court justice, including the Chief Justice of the United States. Did Wilson say the quote? Well, certainly Wilson did send a note to Dixon saying it was a splendid production, but there's no independent verification about that history with lightning quote. We do know that Chief Justice White, 
though a former Confederate in Louisiana, was perturbed when he kept hearing his name as an alleged endorser of the movie, and he had to tell Dixon to can it or he would come out and condemn the movie. But that didn't exactly happen with the president. Wilson was prompted by his secretary, Joseph Tumulty, to disavow the comments. He did not. The only commentary we could ascertain about Wilson's view of the movie is that he did not want the movie shown during World War I. It would be too divisive, he felt. Because of all the controversy, the movie was extremely successful, and it made $3.7 million in New York City alone, thousands of showings across the nation. It was also credited with a dark history, restarting the Ku Klux Klan in America, an organization that would terrorize blacks throughout the South, and now in its second instance, booming in a period after the movie and going through the 1920s and 30s. In its second instance, it would also be strong in the North. Griffith had succeeded in a way, although he would take a lot of criticism that impacts his influence on movie history even today. Griffith would end up coming out with another movie called Intolerance, which was a dual message. One was to try to make up for the criticism he was getting about his previous subject, and the other was to show the intolerance of people, particularly reform movements like the ones that were condemning his movie Birth of a Nation. The movie had even more elaborate sets than Birth of a Nation, and it was a flop. Whether or not Wilson made the writing history with lightning quote, we don't know. We do know that a person who was present watching the movie said years later that Wilson made no comment at all. Whether he said it or not, the impact of the film on people was apparently not lost on him. During World War I, he enlisted a journalist, George Creel, along with the Secretaries of Navy and War, to form the Committee on Public Information, CPI, producing, among other things like flyers and speeches, movies such as Pershing's Crusaders and America's Answer, all of which encouraged young Americans to join the draft and support the war effort. Creel was a supporter of Wilson in the 1916 election and felt that, and he felt that rather than just censoring the media, in a democracy, you needed to produce the media to have a positive official government message. That's what he did. We talked about Griffith's innovation on the screen, but one of them was filming movies on the West Coast. Previously, New York and New Jersey had been where movies were filmed. That's where Thomas Anderson operated out of. But moving to California, you could get the maximum amount of sun. Among several towns near Los Angeles, Birth of a Nation was filmed in a large patch of agricultural land once called Rancho La Brea, an area that produced grain, hay, bananas, and pineapples at one time. In 1886, the land was split up, and developer H.H. H. Wilcox decided to subdivide his land further, making small lots that he could sell to Midwesterners seeking to winter in California. He paved a few roads, and at the suggestion of his wife, he called his area Hollywood. It worked, and Prospect Avenue, now Hollywood Boulevard, surged with Victorian and Mission Revival houses. Soon it would add churches, schools, and a library. It was so prosperous that in 1910, Los Angeles annexed it. A year later, the Nestor Company opened the first film studio in an old tavern. Griffith, Cecil DeMille, and other key players in the new industry followed actors, studio executives, but also hundreds of workers. The film industry was labor-heavy, took lodging in now subdivisions of subdivisions. Banks and commercial buildings started to replace those Victorians. It was in 1923 when Harry Chandler, newspaper publisher and promoter of the city of Los Angeles, spent $21,000 to build a giant electric lighted sign on the top of a hill overlooking Hollywood and Hollywood Lake. It read... Hollywood land. And each of the letters were 43 feet tall and 30 feet wide. It was designed to promote his new real estate development, Hollywood land. That was only a limited success. And by 1949, as the sign started to decay, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce removed the land from the name. And as they replaced the letters, left the icon that we know today, the sign that says, Hollywood. Symbolic of an industry that affects our lives, that affects our entertainment, but also from time to time, our politics. The early pioneers of the new film media may have overstated the ability of the lighted screen to influence our minds. 
We might be better now at distinguishing truth from propaganda. Or we could be as oblivious to the subtle influence as our cousins from the 19-teens. What is the fidelity that filmmakers owe when they portray history? What is the fidelity they have to it? Is it even plausible to bring you, a 2013 viewer, back to a certain time where 300 things are happening at once? There are certainly levels of fidelity. Let's put it this way. We know at least that a sloppy presentation, costumes, manner of speaking, casting, sets, observance of timelines. We know that a sloppy presentation could be better. We notice it when it's not done well. And these days there are a high standard for these productions. When HBO puts you on the boardwalk in Atlantic City in 1920, really, a set in Staten Island as the real Atlantic City is too bright and too built up, you witness a thin, almost frail Steve Buscemi character roaming the boardwalk, delivering favors and money, consorting with gangsters, all the while wearing his red carnation. He is Nucky Thompson, the treasurer of Atlantic County and controller of the political machine that runs the Atlantic City area in the HBO series Boardwalk Empire. Yet as the show progresses, Thompson becomes more and more like the gangsters that he consorts with. If he doesn't get what he wants, he takes care of you any way he can. That's a little bit different from the reality of some of the people in the Atlantic City area who knew the real Eunuch Johnson. The reality would have been a hulky Enoch Johnson, more Telly Savalas, but they got the carnation and the depth of his control over the boardwalk down pat. And they demonstrate how he worked well with the African community in Atlantic City, despite the rise of the Ku Klux Klan we talked about earlier during the same time. No revision there. Sets dress, all are meticulous in matching the time. But there are other aspects troubling enough that some people who know the real Eunuch Johnson have been disappointed by. TV's Nucky Thompson is far more violent, according to the author of the book Boardwalk Empire that the series was based on, Nelson Johnson, no relation to Nucky. The real threat, Johnson said, was economic ruin. If you cross Nucky, You'd be ostracized, he'd pull your licenses, he'd tell customers not to frequent your business. But that kind of thing is harder to portray on screen, so violence becomes symbolic for it. To Nelson Johnson's knowledge, no evidence has ever surfaced that Eunuch Johnson killed someone or even ordered a killing. On the TV show, Eunuch Johnson is competing with gangsters. Now, Nucky Johnson, in reality, did work with some of those gangsters, and he did organize an Atlantic City conference of them in 1927, where they were hosted. But his operation was more of getting a cut on the booze uh, that was going through Atlantic City, not competition with the business, as is portrayed on the movie. Capone and the other gangsters were not fixtures in Atlantic City. They did not deal with local figures as is portrayed on the show. Nelson Johnson also feels that the TV show shows that dealing mostly with his brother, the sheriff, and the ward captains, Johnson, as a political machine leader and a politician, spent a lot of time with little fellows. Again, one of these things that are tough to show on the screen. Well, no harm, no foul, because Nucky Thompson, or Johnson, is not a significant figure in history. In fact, HBO has done us a service by telling us about someone and a phenomenon that went on in 1920 that we were probably unaware of before. But what if you portray someone who's more important to our history, like Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president? As you know, Steven Spielberg took this on. And the result was originally a mode of historical figure, one that 21st century audiences could understand, a smiling, charming, storytelling jokester who could also get serious when he needed to be. Portrayed by Daniel Day-Lewis, it is the story really not of Lincoln's whole life, but of one little part of Lincoln's life, the struggle to pass the 13th Amendment in the House of Representatives. It's a good movie overall, if I can play film critic for a minute, and it gives younger audiences a type of history which is good. I'm a supporter, as a politics buff, that you see the raw politician perspective, which is a contrast with other portrayals of Lincoln. As you watch the movie Lincoln, in one scene, Daniel Day-Lewis is an exhausted, very human president sitting in his dim study. You can feel him bearing the weight of difficulties. And to help you with that, there's a loud ticking sound of a gold watch. The tick of the watch is Lincoln's real watch that he owned 
amplified and put through sound by Mr. Spielberg. This is how far the movie goes in addition to costumes to take care to present Lincoln as a real man. That being said, the film takes a few liberties which historians have noted. In the opening scene, soldiers read Lincoln the Gettysburg Address that he had delivered. That is something that just would not have happened. His speech was not widely distributed or memorized by most people, and the speech didn't get its place that it has now until the 20th century. Yet it's a dramatic moment. In the desire to have more of a feature role for Mary Todd Lincoln, played by Sally Fields, she is berating congressmen at parties and attending meetings of the House, not activities that historians say she would have engaged in at the time. Thaddeus Stevens, played by Tommy Lee Jones, has a relationship with his black housemaid, and that is described as the reason for his vote when Stevens had many other reasons to support the 13th Amendment, represented his politics for his entire career. Stevens did not appear on the floor to disavow his feeling that races were equal in all things, and then to say in order to help the passage of the 13th that it was just in the law that he felt they were equal. This is just a dramatic flair. One historical flaw has been quite upsetting to the nutmeg state. The movie depicted two Connecticut lawmakers as voting no on the 13th Amendment. In reality, all of Connecticut's representatives voted yes. Said Congressman Joe Courtney, I could not believe my own eyes and ears. I understand an artistic license will be taken and that some facts may be blurred to make a story more compelling. But this was easily verifiable, the congressman said. In response, the screenwriter for Lincoln said that they honored the time-honored standards for creation of historical drama, which is what Lincoln is, historical drama, and that there was more opposition in Connecticut than the votes of the representatives might portray. And the movie was representing it through the one way it could, the state's votes. Other nitpicky points, Lincoln would not have met with the congressional lobbyists who were bribing uh, congressmen for votes, he never would have hit his son. James McPherson, the historian, liked the portrayal of the movie, his gauntness, his storytelling, he said. But he did not like the cursing. He rarely, if ever, McPherson said, used profanity. I thought that was a bit jarring. The house as depicted in Lincoln is good for a dramatic movie, but it didn't reflect how it works. For dramatic effect, they voted by state delegations. Voting was done alphabetically. A eh, little nitpicky. But more importantly, members in Lincoln, in the movie, just seem to speak whenever they want. The speaker's gavel seems toothless. A member is insulted by Thaddeus Stevens. That was a no-no, even in a raucous political time. It's nitpicky because what the movie does do with all this drama is give people a sense of the politics of the time, that the North was not united in support of the war, in support of abolition, or in support of the 13th Amendment. There were battle lines, and the politics were very divided. And how else to do it but a raucous Congress? The movie's theme is that Lincoln balanced a meeting of Confederate Peace Commissioners, including Vice President Stevens, which occurred on February 3rd, 1865, and using it to get moderates to help him pass the 13th, which happened on January 31st, 1865. This is a potential theory, but it's not definitely known. Historian Eric Foner sees the rush to put the 13th Amendment as the main story of the movie as a detriment to understanding the history. The emancipation of slaves, he said, was a long, complicated historical process. It's not in the work of one man, no matter how great. Lincoln only decided in 1864 to be in support of the amendment. The, the movie depicts a rush to pass the 13th in the lame duck Congress. It is true that a Congress had been elected in 1864 on Lincoln's re-election that was more Republican than the one that Lincoln was cajoling and then by March, it would have easily passed the 13th with a surplus of votes. Three million of four million slaves were already free by the Emancipation Proclamation. Sherman's army was sacking South Carolina. Slaves were leaving and sometimes seizing lands and plantations. Foner says that's the story that should be told in a movie. It is a betrayal of the job of the historian to explore the unknown, says Steven Spielberg but it is the job of the filmmaker to recover what is lost from memory. There you have it. Movies are always stitching together the details that historians cannot because they're not known, usually favoring those 
that have more dramatic effect. But how far can you take it? Here's the screenwriter of Zero Dark Thirty, Mark Ball, portending to be the story of the killing of Osama bin Laden. His movie Zero Dark Thirty implied that evidence from tortured individuals led to Obama's capture, when it did not. The screenwriter said, in defense, I think it's my right, by the way, if I firmly believe that bin Laden was killed by aliens, to depict that. In this country, isn't that legit? So, I guess somewhere between perfect documentary, poetic license, and justice by aliens lies the right way to make a historical movie. But all of this becomes more important when one considers not the inadvertent slips in a historical presentation, but rather the movies that have a political agenda. And they're quite common now. Those who want to insert into the story, not aliens, but fictional facts to lead you to a conclusion helpful to their politics. Let's talk about that. It goes without saying that in the early 1990s you couldn't do a YouTube video. And if you had a computer with a Pentium chip, real player software, and a really fast and expensive cable modem, you could eventually look at short videos. But for the rest, it was VCR. And that means it was a commercial accomplishment to sell 300,000 copies of The Clinton Chronicles. The gist of the video? Bill Clinton is a murderer. It was the video version of that other 90s trend, the chain email, one called the Clinton body count connected dead people to the president through speculation and innuendo. When Bill Clinton was elected, the warm narrative's voice begins, many Americans were unaware of his criminal record. The cumulative effect of providing hints of circumstance after hints of circumstance is clear. The viewer should start thinking that, well, at least one of these must be real. The video presents the story of two boys killed near railroad tracks in Arkansas, a case featured on unsolved mysteries. Clinton was connected politically with the coroner who ruled on the case. The movie suggests that he had something to do with changing the coroner's results. As long as he ruled the way Clinton wanted, he kept his job, the movie opines. With help from Jerry Farwell, the tapes took off. During his program, the filmmaker appeared as a hidden figure, his face and voice disguised to protect his identity, for he surely would be harmed. After all, with a president out there committing crimes... Perhaps he, the filmmaker, would be the next victim. Oliver Stone, no friend of the grand old party, could perhaps be credited for waiting until after the president's re-election to release W, the unauthorized movie biography of the sitting president at the time, President George W. Bush. Surprisingly, it was somewhat empathetic, but it did present President Bush as eager to impress his dad and going to war in Iraq for that reason. High-grade, unadulterated hooey, said Jeb Bush who along with Ari Fleischer, Condoleezza Rice, Don Rumsfeld, and Colin Powell said they were portrayed in the movie but not interviewed for the movie. Stone used many of the books out at the time for his sources. The movie plays on well-known stereotypes. There's been a significant debate about the movie because it was a flop at the box office. For filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza, the re-election was the time to launch 2016, Obama's America. In it, he argues that the president's strong anti-colonial views originating from his father and his education, those of a 50s Kenyan tribe, if re-elected, would lead Obama to destroy America from within. He immediately makes two points to establish his credibility. One, he doesn't discount the notion that Obama was born in the United States. He was born in the United States, the movie affirms. Secondly, Salza says that his own upbringing was very similar to Obama, therefore he knows the views about America that Obama would have been taught. Newsweek calls the movie a ranter's peddling. A couple of points are blatantly false. Obama is said to have asked for the release of the Lockerbie bomber when, in fact, the administration sent protests to the Scottish government about the bomber's release. The movie says that Obama funded Brazilian oil exploration to beat the U.S., but this is not true. As a credible source in the movie, they interview a friend of Obama's father. In Michael Moore's Sicko, he is on a boat in Guantanamo Bay and approaches the U.S. base there with a group of 9-11 responders who have not been able to receive health treatment due to health care costs and their lack of insurance and the lack of coverage at that time for health care for 9-11 responders. Not surprisingly, his unauthorized vessel 
is turned away from the U.S. base. The responders in Michael Moore sail their vessel to Cuba, where they receive treatment in a large, modern facility in Havana. The movie goes on to talk about cases of patients sometimes dying or being seriously injured due to lack of health insurance or health insurance treatment denials by HMOs. Then he visits the UK, France, and other countries with better health care systems where some costs are paid. In the UK, he gets money for going to the hospital. While the movie presents some indisputable facts, critics have charged the depiction of the Cuban health care system as overly simplistic, that the average Cuban would not have been treated in a facility as high quality as the distinguished American visitors to the capital, that in fact the floor that they appeared on was set up for Cuban tourism, for foreign visitors who generally are paying. America's health insurance plan, of course no fan of the movie, said that many of the cases featured in Sicko were 8, 10 years old, reflected coverage policies which had been changed either by the companies or by law, and that one case depicted in Sicko reflected an auto accident where auto insurance should have been first payer on the claim, and therefore the health insurance claim being denied might have been reasonable. Other bones of contentions. And Canadians who travel abroad often need to return to get covered health care. But the way Mr. Moore presents this fact is exactly the reverse, that a Canadian leaves a golf tour of Florida so he can go back to Canada and get health care there because it is better. Healthcare systems in Europe are presented as free. Well, in the UK, the National Health Service is an example of a socialized system which goes as far to being free as you can get. Everything is paid for, and physicians work for the government. Uh, but in other countries in Europe, there are costs, either in the form of a large sales tax, like in France, and many people in France have to go buy their own private insurance. In the Netherlands, there's a 9% payroll tax to pay for health insurance. In Germany, citizens are forced to buy health care insurance from insurance companies, which look very much like American companies, but they have access to an insurance pool if they end up in a situation where they cannot afford it. A sympathetic Canadian cardiologist called the movie a gem, but criticized it in a journal article in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology for entertainment at the expense of journalism. He felt it misrepresented the funding mechanisms of Canada and the wait time issue, which was a serious one. Still, Michael Moore's website points out at the time, still there now, some facts in the movie are just simply indisputable, that there are still millions of Americans without health insurance, that the health insurance lobby has contributed to candidates, including Hillary Clinton, and it almost goes without saying to anyone with health insurance in America today that sometimes you'll have to fight with your HMO in order to get the coverage that you were promised. You can see some of the reasons that Griffith, Wilson, Michael Moore, Oliver Stone all saw the value in the film medium for a political purpose. It is a kind of super visual communication that flies over argument. Critiques of movies, like the one that I'm giving a little bit of now, come later, after the person has already spent two hours of the theater or on their couch hearing one point of view told in a way that is high on emotion with a musical background, with a human face. It's not just an argument or a blog with words on the page or on the computer screen. It's in a voice, and that voice could be highly emotional. The wife, whose husband died, she says, because of an insurance claim denied. It connects viewers with an issue in a way that dueling politician debaters with white shirts and blue ties cannot. I might argue that there's a cost for all this super communication, though, a cost that means almost every film presentation has holes. And unlike a written argument or verbal interview, it's not easy to correct film bias with another presentation, because that correcting film you may want to make may never make it into a project. These films cost a lot of money to make. Or more importantly may never become successful and greatly watched. So for almost every movie that Michael Moore makes, there are counter movies, but not all of them are greatly watched. And they're simply not as entertaining as, uh, as what Moore puts together. 
Movies need gripping stories not available in every political issue or every side of a political issue. The visual medium does not provide for complexity, explaining a difficult issue like, say, some of the positives of the Reconstruction governments in South Carolina after the Civil War, the primacy of of auto insurance during a car accident, some of the factors that might go into a presidential decision to go to war. No one has a perfect idea of what goes on deep in history or what goes on in private rooms of recent history. The filmmaker's choice, though, is always clear. You go with the more exciting story. Otherwise, the high threshold of making a movie, the budgets, the need to fill seats in the theater or to sell DVDs may not happen, and your story will never be told. That's why I am not surprised that the story of choosing Sarah Palin as the vice presidential candidate of the McCain ticket in 2008 would be told in a movie form and would be told soon. Game Change, the HBO series in which 2008 VP candidate Sarah Palin is played by Julianne Moore. The movie's strength is that it uses a book by the same name, Game Change, as its source. And the known sources for Game Change in the book, at least for the McCain campaign, were Steve Schmidt and Nicole Wallace of the McCain campaign. Both worked with Palin directly. This may also be its weakness, however. So-called handlers, campaign people, can be adversarial with their candidates at times, especially those that go a little rogue and have their own ideas. Maybe they're not the objective source just because they work closely with the candidate. But let's develop this more before I go on that tangent. The movie depicts a candidate ill-suited for the campaign, blinded by religious zeal and naivete. Yet also, it's a sympathetic figure with a warm family life, with a desire to serve the country and party, and a talent for bringing ordinary people into politics. This is portrayed well in Game Change. More time is spent on the screen portraying Palin as a bumbling and forgetful candidate. And that's been called into question by Elaine Laffrey of Miss Magazine. Dumb, mentally unstable people don't work their way up to governor, which she did from top to bottom, Laffrey said. Read her emails. They don't reflect her being dumb at all. Palin's portrayal as not willing to go on stage with anyone who's pro-choice, is in contrast with her appearances several times with Joe Lieberman during the campaign, or an event where the Los Angeles president of the National Organization for Women introduced Palin. While on screen, Woody Harrelson, as Steve Schmidt, scolds Palin for lying about the Troopergate scandal, lying about uh, that that scandal of firing a trooper in her state, who was her ex-brother-in-law. Schmidt yells at her. The report said you abused your power. You lied. The movie doesn't reflect the whole situation. That was one report. That was a report created by the Alaska legislature. Another report that was delivered by the Alaska Personnel Board cleared Governor Palin of wrongdoing in the case. So there was some division there. The movie presents history as one where McCain's campaign simply didn't vet Palin on policy because of the time or because McCain ordered them to find me a woman for VP. Something that McCain never said. It's just for dramatic effect. Arthur Culvehouse, who did the vetting, who's portrayed on uh, HBO's Game Change, said in 2009 that he disagrees with how the movie portrayed what he did. He said he asked 74 questions on policy during the vetting process and admired many of her answers. The movie presents Palin as unable to brief, uncertain as who were the sides, the Axis and the Allies in World War I and II. This is strongly contested. The movie presents Palin going into catatonic states, one point, sleeping in a fetal position. This is all contested by the governor's friends. Meg Stapleton, one of uh, Palin's aides, was with her during the campaign, called Schmidt a bully said all of the scenes with Palin bumbling, messing up things, she just claimed never happened. Other critics of the movie have pointed out that Schmidt is the one who made the big mistake of the McCain campaign when John McCain canceled the debate with Barack Obama and went to Washington to try to solve the economic crisis. That, they said, was more of a contributor to McCain diving in the polls. And while it's covered in the movie briefly, doesn't get the same attention as some of Palin's mistakes. Now, 
Counter critics to these criticisms have pointed out that there are some known facts. She clearly didn't perform well in one-on-one interviews with national journalists. She angered the New Hampshire GOP by canceling events at the last minute. She gave an interview with William Crystal, which sabotaged the McCain campaign. And while it's clear that uh, there are many reasons why a campaign loses, uh, never just one, Polls, exit polls, do show that Palin was a drag on the McCain ticket. Here's the exit polls conducted by Edison Media Research and Matovsky International for the National Election Pool. That's what was used by ABC, AP, CBS, CNN, Fox, and NBC. 300 polling places among 17,836 Election Day voters. Is Palin qualified to be president? 38% yes, 60% no. Was Biden qualified to be president? Yes, 66%. No, 32%. What was the importance of that Palin selection to your vote? Important, 41%. Not important, 53%. What Palin did was energize social conservatives behind McCain, which is something he needed. I think a fair look at the history of the 2008 election should reveal this. And she did a job, which is an important job for a VP candidate in gluing the wings of the party. For example, 74% of Republicans, 66% of conservatives, and 62% of white evangelicals thought Palin was qualified to be president. But outside of those groups, her standing was weak. 64% of independents believed her to be unqualified. Voters who say they favored Hillary Clinton over Obama, a group some Republicans expected to defect because of the Palin choice. Among them, only 12% of Clinton supporters thought Palin had the necessary background to become president. So I think critics of the movie say it's not important to talk about Palin or to discuss Palin, especially in terms of McCain losing the election. That would tend to argue with that. Yet you might argue this, that the story told in Game Changes is now going to be the story of Palin for at least millions of cable-watching Americans. And the words of critics and some of the facts being pointed out is not likely to stick. Now, the answer could be more film and more counterfilms. Maybe we need the story of how Schmidt ruined the campaign for McCain. Maybe we need what Obama did badly on the campaign trail. Maybe there were some moments he got tired, right? Maybe we need a vision of market-based health care. Perhaps we need where Europe goes wrong, or we need... The victims of Atlantic City corruption in the 20s, instead of idealizing one corrupt figure. Or, as Eric Forner suggested about Reconstruction, a story of how slaves left plantations and freed themselves. Maybe, in a free society with a First Amendment, more speech is the answer. And if speech is occurring from movies that people feel are one-sided, more movies. So it's good to be aware of the trend and the history of how the lightning writing goes way back. I'm not uh, taking a position for or against the use of movies in politics. I just think it's something that people need to be aware of, that it's a useful tool, but also has its shortcomings. I want to bring up a personal example. The other day, I participated in a discussion with a group of distinguished people. Chris Novembrino from Don't Worry About the Government, put together a round table of podcasters. Kevin Gostola from The Dissenter, Fire Dog Lake, and Dan Carlin of Common Sense and Hardcore History. It was great. You should listen to it at Don't Worry About the Government, or I have a link to it on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site. We discussed the Fourth Amendment, given the revelations of Snowden. And one of the things that uh, Dan Carlin said after we went over the myriad possible fixes to a problem of restoring uh, Fourth Amendment rights in a better way, the judicial, constitutional fixes, protests that might be needed, etc., Dan Carlin suggested that perhaps a movie, something like George Orwell's 1984, but for modern times, might help to demonstrate to average people about what is really a you know, amorphous political discussion, a movie might be able to teach citizens about the danger of a government going too far with too much power, with too much information over the communications we have. I realized then, especially because I was, while participating in that discussion, was in the middle of writing this one, that you see 
whether it's global warming or health care, guns, or an allegedly ill-intentioned chief executive. There's an appeal to movie, as it is a kind of super communication that gets around all the arguments. It has a narrative. It has emotion. It can turn opinions. And yeah, for an arcane issue that might get 25%, a movie may be the only way. Now, there's always two sides and there's always a cost. So while I think it would be a great idea to make such a movie, there would also be side effects. Because once you introduce the movie medium, you have to realize you're going to be picking extreme cases or you're going to be fictionalizing events to create the darkest future in order to be sure to sell tickets and in order to be sure to get funding to make the movie. Still, I think for a political issue like that, you know, if there is a force that started to shut down podcasters, let's say, one by one, I, too, would strongly be advocating the movie format, a documentary, perhaps, interviewing all of us and what happened to us, as one way to get the message out. Side effects be damned. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you like the program, please tell someone about it. Thanks for listening.